Donald Trump has always claimed, I'm really rich. But for a rich guy, he sure does a lot of stuff that can't possibly be making him all that much money. When it comes to great stakes, I've just raised the stakes. My new game is Trump, the game. What do you think of my Trump home mattress collection by Serta? Since the 80s, Trump has slapped his name on all sorts of products, and he's still doing it. We're gonna remember SneakerCon. Just this month, he was selling official $400 gold Trump branded sneakers. You're all sneakerheads. You're sneakerheads, right? Now, Donald Trump, as far as I can tell, has never worn sneakers in his life. He wears black dress shoes, brown casual shoes, and white golf shoes, and has done so for 50 years. You know, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Okay, man. Now, people don't make all that much money from endorsement deals. Certainly not. And billions and billions of dollars. And it can only lead me, and a lot of other people, to one conclusion, that he's a bit short on cash. Donald Trump falsely, knowingly, inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself, his family, and to cheat the system. This is the New York Attorney General Tish James speaking the day before SneakerCon. She, like all of us, loves drama. Donald Trump may have authored The Art of the Deal, but he perfected The Art of the Steal. Yikes. Donald Trump faced up against Tish James and lost. Just this month, he was ordered to pay $463.9 million for lying to banks about how much money he has. And he's facing at least five more cases that could cost him millions more in legal fees and fines. This is all happening as he tries to run for president again. And political campaigns ain't cheap. So the question is, can Donald Trump make it to election day without running out of money? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. Donald Trump is involved in at least six court cases at the moment. But today, I want to focus on the one which just ended with a nearly half billion dollar fine and Trump getting dunked on by America's most disappointed school principal, Attorney General Tish James. The scale and the scope of Donald Trump's fraud is staggering. And so too is his ego. Because this one case shows how precarious Trump's financial situation is and how easily he could run out of cash before the end of the year. And given it's Trump, the story is, unsurprisingly, mostly about golf. Oh, nice. And it starts, as many of his stories do, at his Florida club, Mar-a-Lago, which is great because my producer, Yasmin, can use this music. Mar-a-Lago defines its rich heritage with an old world elegance that is updated for today's lifestyle. Mar-a-Lago has pretty much been Donald Trump's favourite place since he bought it in 1985. It only has two floors. The first is, it's right at the end of the runway for... Palm Beach International Airport. He hates that airport. It's a total joke. Second, it doesn't have a golf course. Trump wanted it to have a golf course because Trump loves golf. I've always had a great interest in golf. It's a great game. So in the late 90s, he bought a scrap of scrubland between the local jail and that damned airport and turned it into Trump International Golf Club, his first ever golf club. Now, all golf clubs have an annual competition called the Club Championship. Winning it is a big deal. Even many of the most avid golfers never win a club championship. So in 1999, just before his new Palm Beach course was open, Trump played around with a few early members. And he won. It was amazing. Donald Trump declared he was the winner of the club's inaugural club championship. He put a plaque in the clubhouse. He loved it. Owning golf clubs was awesome. Trump went around America, Scotland and Ireland, buying up courses that were bankrupt, naming them after himself, and renovating them, putting chandeliers in the clubhouse, big waterfalls around the course, that kind of thing. I really love shaping land, fixing land, having fantastic locations, and doing the best golf courses. Then he'd play around himself on the empty course, declare himself the club champion, and then open up membership. These people will tell you, have I won many club championships? You gotta be, not easy to win club championships, believe me. Now, golf clubs don't tend to be very profitable, but Trump thought that if the courses were prestigious enough, 
people would pay up to $200,000 for a membership and help him turn a profit. It's not an easy proposition, but Trump is a salesman at heart. He insisted that every course he owned was the best in the world. We have built something that some people have already said is perhaps the greatest golf course in the world. By 2011, Trump owned 10 golf courses, all of which were the best in the world, according to what many people are saying, of course. But it wasn't enough. He wanted more. And this is when Trump started doing things that Tish James would eventually become very interested in. See, Trump wanted more publicity for his courses. He thought that having one of his courses included on the PGA Tour would drive up memberships and make him more money. But he couldn't convince the PGA Tour to include any of his courses. So he decided to buy a course that already had a PGA event. This is when Trump bought Doral. Doral is a giant golf course. Usually golf courses are named after the city they're in, but Doral is so big that the city is named after the golf course. Australian Steve Elkington has won the Doral Open in Florida. Good night, Steve Elkington. What a four at the 18th. The club has been home to a pro tour event since it was built in the 1960s. With a returned confidence on the greens, Norman tamed the course Americans call the Blue Monster. But giant golf courses, just like small ones, are hard to keep profitable. And by 2011, it was bankrupt and increasingly decrepit. Donald Trump swept in, buying the club for $150 million, one of the biggest purchases of his life. The club was desperately in need of a makeover. Chandeliers, waterfalls, the whole deal. Trump got a quote, and the renovation price tag was $250 million. That was potentially a problem. You see, Donald Trump describes the Trump organization like this. To a company that's worth more than $10 billion with the greatest assets, with the greatest assets, some of the greatest assets in the world, great cash flow, very little debt. Now, look, the company is not worth $10 billion, but it does own assets, buildings, golf courses, houses, planes, and helicopter. Would it be fair to call you or to characterize you as a real estate tycoon? Yeah. But the thing he said about great cash flow isn't really true. He didn't have $250 million in cash. Trump would need a loan, a big one. And to get a big loan at a reasonable interest rate, you need to be able to prove that you can pay it back. Thankfully, Donald Trump had for years been employing the toot your own horn strategy. You should toot your own horn. You should talk about how good you are because if you don't toot your own horn, you better do it because nobody else is going to do it for you. Trump had been sending estimates of his net worth to business magazines for decades, tooting his own horn toot, toot. to try and get onto their rich lists. But according to his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, the value of the assets was deliberately inflated. Mr. Trump would call Allen and I into the office. Alan is Alan Weisselberg, Trump's chief financial officer. Weisselberg and Cohen presented Trump with a document saying that he was worth, say, $6 billion. Well, he wanted to be higher on the Forbes list. And he then said, I'm actually not worth $6 billion. I'm worth seven. In fact, I think it's actually now worth eight with everything that's going on. And if Mr. Trump says that he's worth $8 billion, then he's worth $8 billion. Alan and I were tasked with taking the assets, increasing each of those asset classes in order to accommodate that $8 billion number. So if you're Alan, how do you do that in a way that people are going to believe? Well, you say that Trump's penthouse in Trump Tower is actually three times bigger than it really is. And then you employ some seriously creative maths. You look at how much houses around Mar-a-Lago are selling for per acre, and then you multiply that by the size of the Mar-a-Lago land. You ignore the fact that in exchange for a tax break, Mr. Trump had already signed documents saying Mar-a-Lago can't be subdivided or sold as a residential property. And then why not just uh, add a couple of zeros to that estimate? And now once that's all sorted, you just have a wild guess at how much Mr. Trump's New York buildings are worth. Add a few million to that. 40 Wall Street is listed at $530 million. Yeah. Do you know how that value was arrived at? 
No, but it's, I think today worth more than that. Now, I'm not an accountant, but I know that this is not how accountants work. Accountants have to follow what's called generally accepted accounting principles, abbreviated as GAP. And I think it's fair to say that Alan Weisselberg was not applying those principles. Tell me everything you know about GAP. What is GAP? Generally accepted accounting principles. I, I don't know what's in GAP. I never took the CPA exam. Okay. I never studied for it. So the estimates of Trump's net worth were fiction. But like, fine, whatever. It's not illegal to send fictional estimates of your net worth to a magazine. It is illegal to send it to a bank when you're asking for a loan. And that's exactly what Weisselberg did. He sent the dodgy numbers to Deutsche Bank and scored Mr. Trump a big loan with a low interest rate to redevelop Doral. It went fantastically, fabulously, etc., etc. People are saying that Doral is the greatest club in the world now. Everybody says so and such and such. It went so well that Donald Trump pulled the same trick twice more. All this was going absolutely great and probably would have been fine until he became the President of the United States. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. And people started poking around in his finances. Donald Trump and three of his children are being sued by New York's Attorney General after an investigation into their family company. Mr. Definitely Not an Accountant Alan Weisselberg ended up pleading guilty to grand larceny and criminal tax fraud, so perhaps not the safest hands to trust with your finances. And Donald Trump landed himself in court and was hit with a nearly half a billion dollar fine. He has appealed the decision, but will still need to stump up the cash or a bond by mid-March. He's also been ordered to pay nearly $90 million in a separate, unrelated case. Plus, Trump is also facing four other criminal cases, and altogether it's reportedly costing him more than $50 million a year in legal fees. The more immediate concern for Donald Trump might be finding the cash in order to pay the fine. So with the fees and the fines, not to mention the money that he needs to run a presidential campaign, the question is, where is all of that cash going to come from? Well, firstly, not from his own pocket. His lawyers have already indicated that he doesn't have enough cash to pay the fines. He could, of course, sell some of his assets but that would almost certainly expose that the emperor has no clothes. His assets aren't... The greatest assets in the world. So perhaps a loan from a friend? Well, those options are dwindling. In the last eight years, more than a dozen of Donald Trump's associates have been either charged with criminal offences or faced fines in civil court. In the US, Roger Stone has been sentenced to three years and four months in jail. Rudy Giuliani has filed for bankruptcy just days after a defamation verdict. So. His friends have their own problems. What about his supporters? For months now, Trump has been trying to find a silver lining in the court cases. Trump was turning the chaos to his advantage. Every time he's in court, he begs his followers for more political donations. Trump has already raised around seven million US dollars since his arrest was mooted. And his campaign has been using that money to pay his legal bills. But it's not enough. Last month, they spent more than they raised. And history tells us that to knock a sitting president out of the White House, you need to outspend them on the campaign trail by a lot. But Joe Biden's campaign currently has nearly twice as much cash on hand as Trump's, a gap that's been widening in recent months. This is not a normal problem to have. Never before has a US presidential campaign had to pay for lawn signs and bumper stickers while simultaneously paying lawyers to keep its candidate out of prison. A candidate who claims to be a billionaire but refuses to sell any assets for fear of financial embarrassment. It's wild, and it's extremely hard to predict how it's going to play out. But it's sure to be interesting.